good afternoon, everyone. And again, good morning, or perhaps it's night from where you are uh, connecting. So greetings to Swarthmore College and welcome to the dance program. I teach in the program and I'm also the chair of the department. I, I have been uh, teaching here for uh, almost 20 years now. And uh, I just want to you know, begin by giving you a very brief overview of the program. And then I will launch into my research area and present to you um, some aspects of it. Um, so we have a really internationally focused dance program. Uh, we have studio classes as well as we have academic classes. And these academic classes are centered around a growing discipline called dance studies. Perhaps many of you are not aware of this particular discipline. And so our studio classes also have, you know, creative classes like composition classes where you make dance. Uh, we call them our lab classes, but we also have various different styles that are represented from ballet to modern to hip hop to Indian classical dance kathak to um, taiko drumming um, and African uh, traditional uh, diasporic performances. So you can imagine the range. We also have tap. So you can imagine the range of styles. And we also have concerts uh, during the fall and the spring semesters. So we have a really robust program with variety of styles, but we also have a very, you know, um, a rob robust intellectual focus uh, in the department also. So I will be today focusing on my own research and the kind of work that I do with dance. Right? What is dance research? Because that sometimes is an oxymoron. We think that, you know, how can we think about dance and research? So I'll kind of tell you a little bit about my engagement um, with dance research. Uh, so the title of the talk today itself um, is um, an ethnographer among dancers. And I want to kind of briefly uh, talk about why that title? But before I do that, I want to share my screen with you so that you have some images when I start speaking about my particular research focus. So an anthropologist among dancers um, or an ethnographer among dancers. I mean, I actually uh, want to talk about ethnography also. So I am trained as a visual anthropologist and the kind of research I do uh, is about dance ethnography. And, and ethnography, some of you might not know, is um, about doing field work. So traveling to different places and doing field work, which would incorporate something like participant observation or building life histories. These are particular methods of doing research, anthropological research. And um, I'm also trained as a classical Indian dancer. Uh, so that's why this kind of uh, convergence of, you know, the anthropology and uh, the anthropological perspective and dance as a dance artist or a dance performer. You know, I bring these two aspects together. So you can imagine that my uh, research is interdisciplinary, uh, but I'm also a choreographer, so I make dance, which these dances are also interdisciplinary, the dances that I make. So they inform you know, one another, these aspects of my research and artistic work. So I thought that I will share, um, sorry, here, I will share the arc of my research with you so that you get a sense of the kind of humanities research that is possible through the lens of dance. Um, so, uh, the first subject that I took up to do this kind of study was Kathak dance, you know, the dance that I practice. And my first book is titled The Bells of Change, uh, Kathak Dance, Women and Modernity in India. So one of the things I've always been interested in as I um, became a researcher is to kind of look at dance from the broadest context of its representation. That means just not study it in terms of famous artists, like a hagiography, you know, as we think about dance, okay, what is the life of Martha Graham? 
not like that, but as practice, something that is lived and is part of everyday aspect of our lives. So kind of studying it as practice and studying it also in spaces that are not part of high culture, or I would say non elite spaces. So for Bells of Change, what I did was I wanted to study Kathak dance in spaces because it's a classical Indian dance form, it's an elite form, but in spaces where it is practiced by people who are perhaps in the margins, you know, or, you know, in lower middle classes, in small towns, and how this dance empowered them, you know, as dancers, as women. The focus was, of course, on women. And by doing that, what I did was actually reorient the history of Kathak itself, because the Kathak history usually is, you know, in the official national narrative of Kathak, what you will see is that it's a male Brahminical narrative, patriarchal Brahminical, Brahmins are high caste people um, in India. So it's a male high, you know, Brahminical narrative. And the practitioners who were Muslim courtesans, they were in colonial India and pre-colonial India, you don't hear about these women anymore. These courtesans were kind of, erased from the dance history. And I, uh, my research looked at it from that perspective, that from the history from below model and looked at its revival. So kind of it's a historical study as well as kind of an ethnography, looked at the revival of classical Indian dance by Indian elite by British theosophists like Annie Besant. So it's an intercultural aspect of this revival that I looked at and by American modern dancers such as Ruth and Dennis. She was also involved in reviving Kathak dance in India. And I also looked at it to, uh, to its establishment in the modern Indian nation state in academies, in institutions, right? And these were elite spaces and these uh, revivals uh, of classical Indian dances, which is uh, Kathak is part of it, was generally done by women, right, elite women. Um, so through that process, I was also interested in looking at the representations of women in classical Indian dances. Who, who are the women who are dancing and what is represented through these dance styles? And I found that it's mostly, and from dancing it also, it's not that I'm just kind of looking at it from an objective per perspective. I am a dancer myself. And I realized that we are, um, usually representing Hindu uh, goddesses through the Indian dance uh, styles. And the again, the erasure that I'm talking about, the Muslim women or the courtesans are not there in the dance. That is in the national official narrative. And these women were called notch dancers by the British. So if you know the history of India, it was colonized by the British. And the British, when they encountered these women, they called them the notch girls, and they were stigmatized as prostitutes. And so ultimately, in the modern Indian context, you don't see this history at all. So I did that kind of digging and also kind of reimagined the dance as a lived practice in modern India among women who belong to a socioeconomic group that is not part of the elite, which I called lower middle class women. So this is a big subject, but why I wanted to talk to you about my first research subject is because it's connected to my second research subject. And this kind of gives you how, you know, when you're doing research, it's not that you're completely um, isolating your subjects. They are interconnected sometimes. One topic leads to the next one when you're doing this kind of research. So the second research, you know, this book is called, This is How We Dance Now. And it was published in 2017. It is connected because the women who were marginalized or erased, these notch girls, right? The British called them notch girls or these courtesans that I'm talking about, who were erased from the official history, were profusely presented in Bombay cinema or what is called Bollywood dance today. So I was very interested in actually looking at these representation of women, you know, in Bombay films and looking at some of the changes that has happened in Bombay films or Bombay cinema, because now it is called Bollywood, 
maybe some of you are aware of Bollywood dance or Bollywood films. So I call this book, This is How We Dance Now. And you can see that bells of change, that there was this change coming in Indian society as dance was being reimagined you know, in multiple ways. And now this is the way we are dancing. So the, uh, the continuities between my two research subjects I wanted to share with you is that this particular picture, the first image, um, can you hear me okay? I just want to make sure. Hello? Yeah, Professor, we hear you fine. Okay, and you can see also, right? I just want to make sure that, uh, okay, perfect. good, good. Okay, perfect. So this particular image, the first one, the black and white, black and white image is coming from the 19th century. It's an archival image of the notch girl. And this particular image, the second one that you're seeing, she's, you know, sitting in this particular fashion. There is a continuity there is from a Bombay or Bollywood film called Umrao Jan, which was um, released in 1981. So, and this is 18 something, you know, uh, in the 1800s, this picture. So you can see there is a continuity and this notch girl or this tawaif, you know, they were called tawaifs, um, or the courtesan is represented in Bombay films or Bollywood films. So I was very interested in this continuity as well as how Indian classical dance is represented in Bombay films now in the modern Indian period. So I wanted to share with you some of the key questions that I was interested in kind of looking at these transformations. So the first question is what are the aesthetic changes we see due to cultural globalization? And I will uh, you know, later just hint on what that means, cultural globalization, it's a big uh, term. Second question, how has traditional aesthetics changed from classical to commercial or popular songs? So basically you can see from classical to when we talk about Bollywood, it's a more of a commercial context, right? Bollywood is a commercial cinema context. So, you know, what are those aesthetic changes when we are looking at song and dance? What are item numbers? And I'm going to elaborate uh, what that is. How are these item numbers being circulated today in media other than films? Because as you see, I'm going to be talking about reality shows. So this is the transformation or the transmission of Bombay films or Bollywood, not just on cinema screen, but to television screen. So, so much is going on with dance. And who are the new authorities of dance? Keep what that has happened. And what kind of um, democratization of the arts does it bring to the picture? As you can see, I am always interested in finding spaces for dance that are non-elite or not usually associated with high culture. Uh, even if, if it's, you know, context, even if the context is classical, I try to see its use among the everyday people rather than just famous artists. So this particular picture you see, Janak Janak Pal Baje, it's a very famous Bombay cinema because Bombay films or Bollywood films were called Bombay cinema prior to the 1980s. And you can see these are Indian classical aesthetics, this particular hand gesture. Um, these are dance aesthetics. If you've never seen Indian classical dance, you will, uh, you know, I can kind of point out to you the particular expression, the face is uh, spiritual or kind of, you know, far away look, the eyebrows are the way they are kind of uh, shaped. All of this has a particular aesthetics and it's drawing from the classic classical tradition. And many of the stories were also uh, about you know, this particular kind of training system that is uh, very much part of Indian classical uh, dance. And they are called the Guru Shishya system. Guru is teacher, Shishya is student. And the stories in Bombay cinema is to revolve around these dancing girls and the Guru Shishya system. So it was part of the narrative structure of the film. This particular film is called Pakiza and it was 1972. You can see I've kind of created a chronology. Again, this is very much part of the classical Kathak aesthetics, but this is a courtesan, right? She's dancing. And the, like I said, that the courtesans 
or the notch dancers disappear from the official history of Kathak which becomes a male history, a patriarchal history, a Brahminical history in the national, uh, you know, national uh, history. But these women live in Bombay films. And so this is again, this classical Kathak dance being performed by the, uh, the courtesan in a particular scene. And the film was about this particular courtesan. And many films have these stories of these courtesans. And then, Again, I'm coming back to Murao Jan to show you how these courtesan, courtesan stories continue in Bombay films, right? They are a very popular subject uh, in Bombay films. And each one of these films are really very popular films in, in India and even outside of India. You have to look at the aesthetics, also the way she's holding her veil, the way she's sitting, all of this is part of the same aesthetics. After 1980s, you know, what we are calling cultural globalization is that there was a huge shift and it's connected to the economy. So the economy liberalized and the markets were opened and there were a lot of um, Western influences in India in terms of how the culture was uh, shaping up in this new milieu, in this new global milieu. And Bombay films changed into Bollywood films at that point. Why that happened or all the stories behind it, uh, there, are, there are multiple reasons for it and I really am not going to go into that right now, but uh, you will see that there is a aesthetic shift that happened also with that kind of cultural globalization. And from the classical aesthetics, you see that the aesthetic becomes far more globalized. It incorporates various different dance styles, uh, you know, from salsa to hip hop to, uh, you know, uh, capoeira. Um, if you look at Bollywood dance and what is happening on screen, you will see multiple kinds of traditions are mixing together uh, also with Indian classical dance traditions and folk traditions. And, you know, a genre is being created. So, where is all of these things happening? As I'm saying Bollywood films, you have to kind of think about where this is happening in Bollywood films. These song and dances are happening in something that we call the song and dance sequences in Bollywood films. So Bollywood films are not quite like musicals, but kind of like Hollywood musicals, but it is its own genre. So in the story, there is this See, uh, you will see these sequences where people kind of burst into singing and dancing. And in the past, that singing and dancing used to be connected to the narrative, narrative structure of the story. Like I said, that the story was about a dancing girl, you know, how she's being trained or, you know, the hero is also maybe a drummer or something. But now this song and dance sequences detach from the storyline. So they... It will just appear regardless of story about a dancer or not. So you will see males and females, excuse me, something is there, sorry. Uh, females and males coming and dancing on screen. And this particular film was a mega hit, like a global hit. It became a huge hit in UK. And this uh, song is called Chaiya Chaiya. This song was uh, recorded on top of uh, a mountain. Uh, sorry, on top of a train and people were uh, dancing on the top of the train as they were moving. Then you will see like, you can see the dramatic shifts in terms of the representation of the males and the females, the heroes and the heroines, or perhaps the dancing girls and the dancing boys. And this particular film, you know, there are several dhoom, dhoom means like exuberance. And there were several films that were named like Dhoom 1, Dhoom 2. This became a very catchy kind of film and a catchy title. And this was re released in 2006. And you can see that uh, there is a, this kind of a hypersexualization happens, you know, in representation of the song and dance sequences. And what happens, I've talked about this also, that there is some kind of remixing or, or mixing going up going on with the song and dance. It's drawing from various different genres and it is creating some kind of a unit 
that need not be attached to the film anymore. It detaches itself from the film and it starts to be circulated on music videos and on reality TV, on YouTube as item numbers. So Bollywood now, Bollywood dance has its own identity. So it's no longer attached to Bollywood films, right? It has its own identity and these Bollywood dances are being performed on item numbers in TV or on YouTubes uh, or on music videos. And you can see that again, this hypersexualized kind of, um, you know, gaze that is attached to the dancing girl. And these uh, dancing girls are now called item girls and item boy. So I'm highlighting an item boy here, right? Again, uh, this kind of masculine identity that you see very sexy, uh, you know, masculine identity and he's dancing that you can see that it's a globalized context. And so he's dancing with these women, uh, you know, from various parts of the Western um, world. And, uh, and he's a very famous Bollywood star. His name is Shah Rukh Khan. He's a huge mega heartthrob. Um, and so you see these song and dance sequences are becoming uh, very popular and are being circulated in various different spaces. Like I said that, you know, anthropologist among dancers or an ethnographer among dancers, I'm going back to my own identity that what kind of research I'm doing. So I'm an ethnographer. So I study, I go to the field work, I do participant observation or study people, build their life history. So this is the guy I was following. I was following a few people, but his name is Sajid Jamal. And he used to sell caps in streets of Calcutta. But through reality show and through Bollywood, he became a, a local star. I mean, I can't say he's a fabulously known star, but he has a different lifestyle right now. He was in Houston, you know, choreographing for a show and he's a well-known reality show artist in India. Uh, this particular show, so I was going, you know, as an ethnographer to different contexts and following different people. This uh, lady, she's a reality show artist also came from a very middle-class family and um, she won many, many awards, many reality show awards. And again, you can see this reality show is called Dhoom Machale, you know, taking that title Dhoom from Bollywood, but it creates its own kind of context, right? And in local context, you are taking up this title and reproducing, remixing and circulating it. Um, so you see that, and then uh, again, this, you know, again, I'm just wanting to show you the different stylistic uh, representations you see here, different kinds of dancing that you see here. And then the teachers, uh, you know, because now people are learning, you know, these Bollywood dance, not necessarily from teachers, you have system of learning and interesting from just looking lifting movements and learning movements like that so who are the new celebrities uh, teachers these are the judges of bollywood uh, you know choreographers who will come to reality shows and uh, judge the competitors and so forth so these are the new celebrity uh, you know judges that you see here uh, these are very famous uh, bollywood stars um, and farah khan the person you see on the left. She is uh, a very well-known Bollywood choreographer. She's won many awards. The person who's in the middle, his name is Riptik Roshan, and he is a very well-known hip-hop dancer, self-taught. Um, so you can see that how you have now so many different dance styles that are being represented. Uh, this is Shari Khal in Bombay. I was actually in Mumbai in Film City where these uh, films are shot, and this is where you know students, uh, I wouldn't call them students. They're dancers, you know, dance uh, of reality show. They come and practice dance, and these practices go on for hours. Like maybe they will start at eight o'clock in the morning and go till eight or nine o'clock at night, and they might be doing several dance, uh, you know, learning several uh, dance item numbers. Again, this is Sajid Studio, the person who used to sell caps. 
this is his uh, school or studio and you can see the number of styles that he teaches from Bollywood style to contemporary hip hop, locking, popping, b-boying, crumping, puppet, robotic, tap, salsa, jazz, cha-cha, Latin. You can imagine this kind of remixing that I'm talking about and a complete transformation from some of the earlier images that you saw, which were attached to the classical aesthetics, the courtesans and so forth. Um, and this is another person I was following, Bhaskar, uh, you know, this is in Calcutta, just to give you a taste of what ethnography means that, you know, you are in the field, you are going to different places and you are doing these kinds of participant observation, interviewing people, looking at their dances, building life histories. Remo D'Souza is a famous Bollywood uh, choreographer. Um, and uh, Bhaskar, this person I was uh, following, you know, it's a picture that they have taken together, but this is the kind of networks, you know, ordinary people can make. Ordinary people in the sense that in the reality show world, many people are coming from the working classes. Like I said, the cap seller, you know, many people like him, but they have these elite connections now to Bollywood film uh, choreographers. And, and so they have these kinds of, links, right, networks now to create a career for themselves. And reality shows in India come with a lot of prizes, right, like money or cars or something. If you win the reality show, sometimes it becomes an entry point into a different kind of uh, life, uh, a middle class life or an upper middle class life, a life of an, uh, you know, artist who's valued in society. So dance reality show, you know, this is an audition in Kolkata in 2012 and everybody's born to dance, like totally democratizing the whole idea of dance that you don't really need to go to all these dance schools to learn how to dance, that everybody should be, uh, should have access to dance and everybody who has talent should be dancing. And so this idea is represented in this image that I have captured here. And these are aspiring contestants who have lined up overnight, right? They have been waiting for hours in lines, like doesn't really capture how many people are there. It's really thousands of people are lining up uh, for audition, which is only going to be for five minutes. Uh, so that if they are able to enter the reality show contestant space, then they have a chance for a better life or become more visible in this teeming, you know, Indian um, population. So this is what the meaning of reality show dance and Bollywood is for people who are not perhaps part of the very elite classes or even the middle classes. These are coming from the working classes and the lower middle classes. Um, so I kind of will wrap up with that and I'll open it up for questions, but I just wanted to give you a taste um, of the possibilities, right, of dance research and what it can look like uh, and the ways you can kind of digress from maybe your own interest in dance and kind of go into different spaces with other people's dancing and what kind of meaning they make out of that that kind of experience.